Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to another episode of Glass Half Full, a podcast and a safe platform where we talk with a variety of teachers, entrepreneurs, spiritualists, uplifters, givers, shakers, and serenaders. Everyone has a lesson to learn and a lesson to share. Let's use our life experiences to enrich someone's heart, mind, spirit, and soul. Through sharing our experiences, we can be a learning inspiration for one another. I'm your host, Chris Levins. Let's welcome today's guest. Today's guest is Rachel Astarte. Rachel Astarte, holistic psychotherapist and self-specialist. Rachel Astarte is a holistic psychotherapist, transformational coach, author, and educator specializing in self, solitude, and service. She works with people in midlife who have been called to deep psycho-spiritual work and guides them towards polishing the gem of their true selves toward mentorship in our evolving world. Let's give a warm welcome to Rachel Astarte. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, Chris. Thank you so much for being a guest here on Glass Half Full. We are happy to have you today. I'm so honored to be here. I'm very excited. Thank you. Can you tell everyone where you are in the world and what time it is? I can. I am about half an hour outside of New York City and in Rockland County, and it is 9.05 in the morning at the moment. Yes, and we thank you for being in this early morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fine. I had to take my son to school, so I've been up since 6.30. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, you do have this like 12 o'clock afternoon voice on, so uh, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> So definitely. Well, we're going to just jump right on in. I like to ask all my guests this first question. I believe that our lives are in spiritual design. Can you share your life layout or blueprint with everyone? This is how you grew up, where your family lifestyle up to today's time. Absolutely. So um, I was born in Illinois um, and lived there for a grand total of about six weeks before my father and mother moved to Western New York. Um, My father was a professor of poetry and my mother is an actress and a writer and a director. So my father got a job at a university in Western New York. So that's really where I grew up uh, just outside of Rochester. Mm. And, um, and I have, two siblings. I have an older sister and a younger sister, so I'm right in the middle. So that's probably all your listeners need to know is that I'm a middle child. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I could probably just stop right there. Um, But uh, yeah, so I grew up in, in, um, in Western New York. I love New York state. It's just a beautiful state and always have. Um, And I lived Basically, all of my younger education took place um, in upstate New York. And as soon as I graduated from university, I ran screaming down to Manhattan. I had grown up in a rural area, and so I wanted to be in a city. And I fell in (laughs) love with New York City, just fell in love with it when I was 14, first time I visited. And so I knew eventually I wanted to live there. So I did um, on and off for about 22 years. I took a couple of... Yeah, I I took some time off and went to uh, got my first master's degree in Boston at Emerson College uh, in in creative writing. And um, and then um, I all this time I was pursuing a career, a double career as an actor and as as a writer. Go figure, because that's what my parents did. Um, And. Yeah, so I w- I started writing at four and started acting at five, wow. and um, yeah, and it was just beautiful to grow up in the arts and, um, and you know, 
again, bopped around, but basically lived in New York City. I also took a stint for a year and lived in New Mexico, which was amazing. My mm-hmm. second favorite state in the union. And um, but I never really stopped my creative work. I'm I'm I still do voiceovers today. I still write on a regular basis. But somewhere along the line, um, I really wanted to do something that was more in the healing capacity for for people. And so um, just after my son was born, um, I went back to school and became a, a transformational life coach and a hypnotherapist. And started a practice uh, doing that. But what ended up happening was I realized that I was leaning dangerously close to doing psychotherapy, which was illegal. And you're not you're not supposed to do therapy without a license. So I decided to go back to school, get another master's in marriage and family therapy and pursue uh, that avenue of work and. Um, got my license in New York State, and uh, and the rest is history. So I started my private practice um, around. I started practicing as an intern in 2016, and I've been I've been working ever since. Got my license um, about three years ago. So I had one of those midlife career changes, which mm. people talk about, and I'm so glad that I did. Um, so I've been able to integrate. Um, all of the things that I love into my practice now. Mm, I love that. And you're the boss. Mm-hmm. Oh, I can't have it any other way. I don't do well with authority. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> well, look, it's, it's my own. <laughs> look, we know what we're good at and what we're not. That's, that's part of wisdom as we get older, right? Definitely. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Wow. Well, you have had such an interesting life and lots of education behind it as well. Mm-hmm. And implying yeah. that in. What do you think is the most um, cherishable thing that about your work that you're doing? Oh, it's absolutely working with with people i love to work with people one on one but i love to work in groups as well but it's 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 watching people realize how powerful they are and how special and wonderful they are when and, and we've all been there so it's not just a certain group of people but we've all been through feelings that were not good enough or feelings that um were out of alignment in some way and i love when I can help facilitate in people the self-awareness that they are so vital. Um, And that can happen on a one-on-one basis. Those aha moments you hear about in therapy um, when it's like, oh, that's why I've been a jerk, (laughs) you know, or that's why I've been sad, (laughs) you know, oh, I get it. And it's really not my fault, but it is my power to change it. And I can it's so beautiful to see. It's like the lights go when on. The light and come on. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's why I do what I do. Wow, that's powerful. That's powerful. I want to talk a little bit about um, what's your take on negative self-talk? Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, I I, I say all. I'm assuming we all have it at some point, um, even if it's just some kind of self-doubt talk or that kind of thing. The way that I see negative self-talk is, um, I, maybe I should back it up, every kind of problem that we have, I see it as a blessing. I see that everything that, you know, whatever negativity that's coming through us is really just a self-regulating system. So to give you an analogy would be like you're driving along the highway and your check oil light comes on the dashboard. Now that's a scary light, you know? <laughs> you know, and we're like, oh no, what's happening with my car, so right? True. Well, we we don't pull over and abandon the car because it's broken. We go to the the shop and we get our oil changed and we do what's necessary to get the car running the way it's meant to run. It's the same thing with negative self-talk or or any problems we encounter. That's the light on the dashboard. Mm-hmm. And you know, letting us know something's out of alignment and so we need to adjust. 
So negative self-talk specifically, another analogy that I think works really well is it's like a watchdog. We have this dog that we love. It's our family. But when a friend comes and knocks on the door, that dog is going to get up and bark and sound really scary and mean. Mm -hmm. But what it's doing is it's protecting us, right? So so what, what do we do when our dog barks and there's a friend at the door? We say, hey, it's okay. That's Joe. That's my friend. Good dog. Here's a chew toy. Go over there. Mm. And then that's what they do. When we have negative self-talk, ultimately what it's trying to do is protect us from harm. I'll give you an example. So you're starting out at a new job um, that is like your dream job, or you're, let's just say not even starting out, you're applying for a job that's your dream job. Negative self-talk says, oh, you're going to screw up this interview. You don't even know how to talk right. You know, you don't know what you're doing. People, people are going to look at your resume and say, you're not as good. You're too old. You're not educated enough, right? That's all negative self-talk. Why do we have that? To to prevent us from embarrassing ourselves, mm. to prevent us from, from having our hearts broken, you know? Um, oh, she's never going to go out with you. You're too X, Y, or Z. That's a protection mechanism. So what we do with self-talk, instead of listening to it, imagine if we never answered the door because the dog was barking, right? That's silly, <laughs> right. right? So, so what we say is, okay, we ask this very simple question. How is this thought serving me? Mm -hmm. Is this thought serving my highest good? You're no good at that. Okay, well, is that serving me? No. What can I do with that concern that that negative self-talk has? I can say, well, is that true? Is that true that I don't have the skill set necessary? Well, what will I, I guess I could learn that skill set. So now you've taken negative self-talk and, and turned it into positive self-talk. Or you're not, you know, your resume is crap. Okay, then maybe I can clean it up. Or maybe it isn't crap at all. It's good enough. And if it isn't, I'll learn from that. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're 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 taking the fear and you're sitting in it. You're not pushing it away. A lot it. of people say, right. A lot of people say, oh, negative self-talk, just push it away. No, because what happens? What happens when you have a toddler that wants your your attention? Mommy, daddy, mommy, dad, whatever. And you're like, you're busy, you're busy. They will yell louder mm -hmm. until they throw themselves on the floor and have a fit until you pay attention. The same thing happens with our negative self-talk, negative self, uh, negative emotions, right? They will make noise until we listen. So turn toward them. Okay, negative self-talk. What are you trying to teach me? That I'm not good. <laughs> I know? love that. Hey, negative self-talk. Like, yeah, right. Go ahead on and be like, come on now. What you? I love it. You're right. Turn to it. Turn to it. You are the master. Remember that. You are the master. Your highest self is the master. The negative self-talk comes from your wounding. And it is very important to listen to and learn from, but not to get behind or or believe in. Yes. Right? Yeah. Mm, I love it. You broke that one down, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. For sure. Can you tell us what has been one of the biggest struggles or defining moments in your life? Um, well, there have been a couple. Uh, I'll give it to you chronologically. Um, okay. I mean, well, maybe three. So my parents divorced when I was 13. Um, that was, that's an easy one. Cause a lot of us go through it for me. That was actually a really positive thing. Okay. Um, I was, I was very terribly sad to see my parents were very much in love. My parents just were very creative and couldn't live together. Interesting story. Um, and by the time my father passed away in 2001, by that time, my parents were besties again. So it was fine, but I was on the cusp of puberty and, really didn't want my parents on my back, you know? So in a way, <laughs> their divorce allowed me, we moved out of a rural area and into the college town in which my father taught. So for me, it was a great expanse um, and a great space for me to come into whoever I was going to be. So that was, that was a, a pivotal moment. The death of my father in 2001 was, um, 
a, a big struggle, big struggle. I was extremely close with my father. Um, and it was, yeah, it, it really made me face um, some of the hard, hard lessons about how close I was with my father and how it actually prevented me from coming into my true self. Oh, wow. um, I needed his approval. Um, he was a, an amazing man, a visionary poet and an amazing teacher. And um, of course, he had his faults as well. Uh, we all do. But I was so enmeshed with him that I really didn't venture out into finding out who I was as a person until after he passed. Um, and so I had to go through grief, of course, and I still mourn his loss, whatever it's this year's, I think 22 years later. Um, but I also had, much like the divorce, I had a chance to step into myself again. Hmm. Um, and then the third big defining moment was the birth of my son. Um, and I came to, well, I guess it's not so late anymore. I used to say I was, a, I, I came to motherhood late. I was 40 when I had him, but that's like young Yeah, now. I was about to say, yeah, no, you're, you're good. <laughs> you know, you're good. people are just popping babies out in their 70s now. You know? <laughs> just but, um, but yeah, so, so that was huge because that was a massive shift in who I became. So I spent a chunk of my time defining who Rachel is as a person. And then I had to sort of adjust that to be um, the caregiver uh, to this, to this being, um, you know, unlike a lot of, you know, I guess the, the general trope of being a parent, you know, that you put all your hopes and dreams on your child. Um, I never felt that way. I never felt that my son was mine, if that makes mm. sense. I feel like he belongs to the universe. And he was, I was tasked with bringing him into this human experience. And it's a huge task. <laughs> yeah, but, is. Um, but he is his own being entirely. And he amazes me every single day. So How old is he? He's uh ne uh, like in 10 days from yeah in 10 days from today he turns 13 oh wow you're about to have yeah, a so teenager a you're about yes. to have a teenager all right I mom know. that's exciting oh, no. hey look the job is almost done look you had the at least oh, no. at that least the break well at least the break you know you can you can lean back a little bit you know when they go away a to little. school yes that's true but it's I true guess. you're a parent until the end this is it my mom says that so i believe it as a person yeah. who has no children, but who do work with children and I have oh, nieces, yeah. it's enough. It's enough. Sure. But... <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Thank you for your defining moments as well. I want to change a little bit and talk about solitude. Mm -hmm. um, why do we need regular periods of solitude? One of the reasons, the main reason, right, is, is to turn off the chatter of the world. Um, we need to connect to our higher self. So when I say higher self, I use that in, it's the same term to me as the universe, right? I don't think we are separate from the universe, I think that we are the universe. And when we say, oh, the universe gave me, your higher self gave it to you. That's what we are. We are not separate. And when there's so much chatter in the world and so much stimulation, we need solitude to go into ourselves, to connect to source, to connect to creation, which is where we all, not just human beings, all things come from. Um, Solitude is where we can really ask our higher selves, you know, what, who we are and what we're here to do um, without outside influence of society or the culture in which we live, without the pressures of family, friends, 
um, community to adhere to certain roles. We can take time and solitude to really define for ourselves the path that we are meant to be on. Um, and that's a whole other subject, but, but you know, I am a self-specialist and, and for me, the development of self is essential for the greater good. So it, we don't stop with self-development. That's, that's like writing a bunch of beautiful poems and sticking them in a drawer, mm. right? We're, we're meant to communicate. We're meant to radiate our, our amazing lives into the world, but we can't do it without solitude to ask the purest form of ourself, which is the part that's connected to source and creation. What are we here to do? What am I here to do? What am I here to be? What are my beliefs about the world culturally um, and spiritually? And, you know, why am I here? We can't do this with with outside influence. Um, we need to be able to connect to to the original uh, voice, which is the one we come from. Hmm. It's true. It's hard to be able to focus with the outside noise that comes in mm -hmm. social media, you know, different areas of just general life. So yeah. I agree that there has to be a time that we be able to rejuvenate and renew our strength and our power and our understanding. So there has to be some time where we are working together in that solitude. And I, I think that was a great way that you put it. Um, and yeah. it was also mentioned, you know, in solitude is the idea of you being by yourself, even though the idea is to connect with community. And so yeah. with you being in the solitude, you're able to give to the community. Is that correct? Well, once you have, once you have built what I call a, a strong foundation of self. Yes. When, when we are, when we don't have a strong foundation of self, we're easily whipped around like a really thin stalk of bamboo. You know what I mean? We're mm. just, we don't have the strength to, um, to stand on our own convictions or, or what we are spiritually psycho spiritually put here to do. Um, so we're easily influenced by the masses. We're e easily influenced by, um, or, or if not influenced, confused by all of the stimuli that's coming <laughs> uh, toward us. Right. right. So when we have a strong foundation of self, um, we have to build that relationship first so that when we go out and, and enter in our various communities locally um, and globally, we are contributing the most whole and, and rich form of ourselves. That's what helps collective consciousness. It does not help if we are um, wounded, easily offended, um, if we are shaky in our convictions, hmm. then we go into community and we, that's the energy that we are spreading into the community, hmm. right? So there's suspicion of others. There's, um, the ability you know, or, or the, there's an us and them attitude. That's really dangerous. And I see a lot of that in the world now, you know, hmm. how do you know if you have a strong will of self? So, so a strong foundation of self is, is Sorry, strong foundation of self. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's no problem. Um, it is basically just what it sounds like a foundation. You have ground underneath you, you know who you are. And even if, and I'm not saying that you're enlightened or you're completely self-actualized, but you have a, a general idea of what you believe in and who you are hmm. and what that allows you to do is to allow for others to be different than you without being offended or try to fix who they are mm. or think your ideas are better than theirs. Or judging we them, yeah. Exactly. It's a non-judgmental stance. Even when someone is a complete jerk to you, even when someone is intentionally hurtful, mm. you're able to say, that person is wounded and deserves my compassion. Yes. Not, let me get back at that 
mofo and let me you know <laughs> I have to stand up for my thing my my that's the us and them attitude yes the ego right? that, yeah. exactly that's it's and and let's talk about the ego for a yes, second let's dig into ego, it ego gets a bad uh a bad rap, rap because <laughs> well, ego is important <laughs> There are two kinds of ego. There's yes. the developed ego and the underdeveloped ego. Okay. What you're referring to is the underdeveloped ego. The underdeveloped ego wants to run the show, wants to say, I'm better. All my things are mine. All all my beliefs are important. And I have, you know, anyone who disagrees with me is my enemy, et cetera, et cetera. The developed ego is really a container for our spirit. It allows for room for everybody to have different opinions, um, understanding that we are all spirits having a human experience. We're all here to learn whatever lessons we're here to learn. Hmm. Um, and, and the ego can contain the spirit from flying off and being one of those weird new age woo woo people, you know, that's not <laughs> all grounded because that's the flip side, right? The flip side is being so, uh, so light that uh, you're not taking into account the balance uh, that we have both dark and light within us. The mm -hmm. ego is a beautiful, the developed ego is a beautiful container for that, if that makes sense. Wow. This is the first time for me to hear this. Yeah, this, it did make sense. You explained it very well. Wow. Okay. Look, hey, okay. I'm learning something new. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't waste the day. It's it's almost 12 o'clock here, so I didn't, at midnight, <laughs> I, I still in. Good, good, good. Wow, that was awesome. That was awesome. Yeah. So yeah. I want to change a little bit and talk about um, mentorship and boundaries. Mm -hmm. So I want to know, what is the biggest misunderstanding about boundaries? Yeah. Boundaries are, it's just such an important topic. Um, and I, I think that at, at some point we, we all face <clears throat> um, having to enforce boundaries with people, could be parents or friends or colleagues or whatever. Um, the biggest misunderstanding about boundaries is that they are there to protect us and sort of push away the person uh, for whom we are creating the boundary. So it's like, you can imagine you're drawing a line in the sand, right? You can't cross this line. You stay over there. I'm over here. And I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing that for my benefit. I'm doing that to make sure that you don't step on my, my, yeah, that's ego stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So well, it's ego stuff. the, the truth about boundaries that I haven't heard anyone else talk about, but for my patients, it has made a tremendous difference in, in looking at boundaries in this way. Boundaries are in place for the benefit of both people. So if I draw a boundary, hey, mom, you can't text me after 10 o'clock, right? Because that's my downtime. Unless it's an emergency, I don't want to. This isn't my mother. I'm just this is it. <laughs> I was like, like, hey, look, <laughs> this this is your business. I was not going to say anything about it. <laughs> no, no. But this is this is a hypothetical mom. Uh, mom, don't text me after 10 p.m. My mother knows this, by the way. But don't text me after after 10 p.m. because that's when I go to bed. Right. Because Some mothers are like, oh, you know, so and so. I don't know. Something's going on in the village. Um, if you say if you draw that boundary. It looks like you're shutting your mother out so that you can have peace after 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. In reality, you are actually helping your mother in this in this scenario or the other person for whom you've drawn the boundary. How is that possible? Because you are protecting them from your resentment, from your passive aggression, from your anger at them for no reason that you can't quite put your finger on energetically they are going to pick up on the fact that something is wrong in your relationship and and they can't figure out what it is because you haven't drawn a boundary you have allowed them to enter your space your energetic space however that looks the colleague that comes in first thing in the morning talking when you're trying to have your coffee or you know <laughs> you know whatever it is 
by not drawing that boundary, <clears throat> you are actually um, weakening um, a relationship that is potentially quite strong and good. Hmm. So when we draw our boundaries, they are drawn, and I stress this, they are drawn with love. They're not walls, they're boundaries. If you give me this space, I then have the freedom to have a better relationship with you. Do you see the difference? Mm, yes. Wow. Yeah. So I think it's really important for us to see that the boundaries, yes, the boundaries protect us, but they also protect the other person from our anger. Mm. And that's that's really important. And that allows then the for a much healthier be, relationship. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Oh, I never thought about it like that. Mm -hmm. That's some food for thought for sure. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's a new twist on on a on an old on an old understanding, but this makes sense. This makes because right. it's not a wall, like you say that exactly. it's it's a boundary. Sometimes I guess we get them mixed up, huh? With, with among other things, but yeah, I guess we could get those two mixed up as well. So, yeah, and I think well, sorry, just just to add one yeah one other thing about that because I'm here I'm hearing your listeners go yeah but so um, the the. Some people don't want to draw the boundaries because they don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that is uh, is important to keep in mind. Um, I, I practice in, with my clients, you know, radical honesty. And by radical honesty, I mean to even say those words. I almost don't want to tell you not to text me after 10 p.m., mom, because I don't want to hurt your feelings. That's radical honesty. But here's why I'm doing it. Right. Do you see how much more loving that is than don't text me after 10? You know, mm. that's what I'm saying. So be real when you that's the loving boundary part. OK, I'm done with that subject. <laughs> no, no, no. That was great. That was great. I love it. Radical honesty. That's nice. Yeah. Yes. Just so, so the real giving the real the real. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, it makes it easy when you give the real people know where you say, stand and they know how you are and then we can adapt easily. You know, there's no surprises. You know, I'd mm -hmm. rather know what I'm dealing with than to have a surprise. So we can, we right. can. And it also brings out brings out our humanity, right? That's the whole point of everything you and I have been talking about mm. since we started this half an hour ago. Yes. You know, it's it's um, it's about connection and it's about understanding that every living being and non living being on this planet in this cosmos are really our siblings. You know, they're they're an extension of ourselves. So, yeah. Hmm. I like that. Yeah, they are. They definitely are. Can I ask you, what is mentorship? And what mm. makes mentorship important in midlife? Okay, so mentorship. Um, again, we just redefined boundaries. I um, I often feel we need to redefine what mentorship is. So let me flip this, Chris, and okay. ask you: When you hear the word mentor, what do you how how would you define it? Um, I would think that someone who is taking someone under their wing, giving them advice, um, helping them find their path and their way from their experiences and the things that they have gone through. They're just kind of sharing that information and kind of guiding someone yeah. who's under them. Right. And so in what scenario do you envision this? Uh, probably for, um, for business or for um, maybe like a, a psychologist or therapy, that type of thing or coaching. Um mm -hmm that kind of yeah right and 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 what you just said is a beautiful definition by the way oh wow um, and, <laughs> i was like am i about um, to get exploded like nope that's no, not right no no that's a beautiful <laughs> definition that is you know taking under the wing absolutely um providing support advice but what you said is so true we often first think of this happening in business now i've done a lot of research about mentorship as i started to create my uh, online community for for women in midlife as mentors um, and um, almost all of the mentorship programs take place in the workplace mm. and I thought well wait a minute <laughs> you know what about life and so what about us sharing 
our our life experience. Hmm. So mentorship. Um, so to answer the first part, which you did beautifully, yes, it's taking someone under your wing or a group of people, um, and being able to. And, and there are many ways that one can mentor, but um, but yes, being able to offer support. Advice when asked for, that's important to stress, when asked for. Um, and to be a living presence of um, of wisdom hmm. in one form or another, where, wherever that, wherever you find yourself mentoring. Hmm. What makes mentorship important in midlife is, um, by the time, and I'm, I'm speaking, now this is true of all people in midlife, but I, my niche is women in midlife, although I work with people of all ages and all genders, the entire gender spectrum. So how old um, is midlife? Midlife is generally considered 40 to 65. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, um, or 40 to 60, depends on where you go, 45 to 65, somewhere in that range. Um, so by this time, um, we have, and I'm, again, I'm speaking specifically to about women, we have amassed decades of life experience. And our culture really doesn't want to know about women in midlife. And there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, there are historical, ancestral, spiritual reasons why a woman in midlife is suspect. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Right? Yeah. We're going through menopause. Oh, Crazy. Okay. okay. You know, we are um, we are the living representation of death. Wow. And that's, that's scary. Really? Our free- Absolutely. We, um, oh we are... We are losing our fertility, which means what purpose do, and this is ancestral, right? That what purpose do we have if we are no longer procreative? Mm. In this capitalist culture, there isn't a lot of room for the wisdom of women in midlife. We're not interested. If you can rock a bikini at 57, great. That's what they want to see. Wow. Anti, anti-aging, look how young she looks, so youthful, look at so-and-so, she still looks like she's 35, whatever it is. If you're 80 and you look 60, great, you know. Why? Why that, right? Mm-hmm. So what it does is it, it culturally, it there's like, we enter a vacuum. Women at 40, oh, this was just on CNN, with our friend Don Lemon, who said, you know, women are past their prime. I know he's walked that back, rightly so, <laughs> but um, but that hurt. That hurt a lot of women. Mm-hmm. Some, even one of my clients came to me depressed after hearing wow. this, and I had a had to do a lot of work to 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 unpack that. Mm-hmm. Even something so small as that, uh, a one offhanded comment, it, it it really reflects the pain that women in midlife feel. So it's like we we hit forty. And then we slip into this invisible vacuum and then we get spat out at the other end as an elder. Wow. Um, and where is all of this wisdom that we're supposed to be, that we not supposed to be, that we could be sharing with younger generations? Yes, younger women who are about to enter a world where they are also dismissed. How do we step up and say, no, sister, that's mm. not going to be the case take your life experience and share it with people um, because what you have experienced is essential for the gro- for the for the psycho spiritual growth of all people not just women so um and i i even had uh some questions as i as i just launched this new area of my business about working with awakened women in midlife toward mentorship well, I don't have anything to offer the world. I didn't really do much with my life. And then with this particular person, we unpacked what they have done. And it turned out to be a lot, mm. you know, whether it's 
having children and raising them. That's huge. Those are beings on the planet that are going out and affecting collective consciousness. That's a huge job. Yes. I'll ask your mother. I bet she'll say the same thing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yes, she would. Yeah. And if you it's and if so you do a good fun. job, then you really, you know, if you really love them, that's you really doing it. So, yeah. Right. That's, right. that's one thing. And imagine a lot of women today also have careers. And what have they done in their careers? Well, I don't even like my job. But guess what? On a day to day basis, did you make someone's life easier? Hmm. You know, did you say something to someone who didn't feel good that day and made them feel better? You are making a difference when you do that. That's also what it means to have a foundation of self, why it's so important to do that. So you're not getting caught up in other people's pain. You're able to have compassion and empathy. And women at our age, when we're going through menopause and and um, we're, we're shifting and our hormones are out of whack and everything, this is also a time for us to understand that the changes that we are going through are preparing us to step into even a more powerful level of wisdom, which is what we might call the, the crone years, the, the true wisdom and elder years, uh, when we are no longer bleeding out our power, but retaining it. Mm. And that's what, what we're, we're going through right now. We're metamorphosing into these beautiful wisdom keepers. And so that's why it's important uh, in midlife to step into mentorship, even if that means you're just doing it on a micro level day to day with people that you interact with. Mm. Wow. And connect that, keep that communication between the, the current generation and the young generation to try to bridge in, to share this information. So the yeah, do not be afraid of aging. I would love a, a day that young women actually look forward to, or at least are not freaked out by getting older mm -hmm. because they don't even know, they don't even know the wisdom that's coming to them. Almost every woman in midlife that I talk to tells me how much happier they are than when they were in their twenties. And I'm certainly one of them. Mm -hmm. We just don't even see, um, you know, we don't even see the the blessings that are are coming because so we're so busy trying to be ambitious and all those things. Yeah, <laughs> you're so right. You're so right. Well, you know, some might ask, you know, they might say, well, Rachel, how can I be a mentor if my life is not where it can be? You know, or if my life is not in a, a grand place. How can I still mentor? What do you say for that? Uh, um. It's the same advice that I received as as a an up and coming ther therapist, um, but I've I've adjusted it a little bit for this kind of question. And I I put it very simply: your struggles are your gifts. So if you are not where you want to be, um, you know my marriage isn't going well. I'm in a dead end job. My kids hate me. Those are your gifts. <laughs> Right. Those are your gifts, because guess what? You are doing it. You're living. You're human. And so how so how you get through your day um, is part of what you're helping the younger generation understand is that guess what, boys and girls, it's going to be hard sometimes. Hmm. It's going to be sucky sometimes. And guess what? Here's how I manage to get through it. And guess what, too? I'm still working on myself. There's no plateau we're all going to reach where we're all just waiting for everybody to show up and go like, yay, we're done. You know, we're done. <laughs> we're fully actualized and enlightened and we can stop learning now. You know, no, there is no such thing. We are all a work in progress. Yes. So your struggles are the gifts that you give to your mentees to say, yeah. This is going on. You know, I was doing couples counseling um, in the middle of a of a divorce that I was going through. Wow. You know, and I kept, I was sitting there across you know, across the couch, going like, "How can I possibly give advice about couples when my marriage <laughs> is falling apart?" And then I thought, "But this is how, because now I know what happened. Mm -hmm. I know the struggles, and I know how hard it is." to be at odds with your partner, right? So, so your, your humanness 
is what makes you a good mentor. Mm. Wow, nice. I love that. Great answer. And the ways that we can mentor are by? There are many ways. Um, you can mentor uh, and, and by the way, when I say mentor, I don't mean like you wear, you put the badge on and you just storm into a room like I'm a mentor. You know what I mean? <laughs> Listen to it's, me, it's, everyone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you don't want to be a jerk about it. Um, like, but, sit down. Yeah. Everybody listen to me. <laughs> no, that's not mentoring. Mentoring is to be present, to be awake, aware, and grounded in your foundation of self. And ways you can mentor is be alert to people. And, and again, you're not like a superhero waiting for the call because there's a, there's a crime <laughs> happening. You're, you're just paying attention to when you are called upon to offer your wisdom. That can be a family member, extended family member, nieces, nephews, cousins, whatever. Um, could be friends or friends of friends, mm -hmm. uh, your neighbors, um, obviously the workplace, that's a, a great place to mentor. If you have someone working under you, you know, in the workplace, it's more like old school apprenticeship, right? So, um, and that's where the mentorship really originated. We don't really have apprentices so much, um, in, in mainstream, uh, the workplaces, mainstream workplaces today, but we can mentor certainly in business. You can mentor in your local community. Um, you know, whether you're volunteering or you are, you know, even just, um, if you have like a community garden situation and you know how to grow plants, you can mentor that way. Hmm. Um, there's online, everybody's online now you can, you can mentor online. You know, if, if someone has in a, in so a true. group that has a genuine question and is put, you know, people put questions to groups all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, so and so just happened. What do I do? Be gentle, be a mentor. If you are asked for your advice and you feel comfortable giving it, give it. But mostly, and you know, you don't you don't have to be Tony Robbins. You don't have to write a book. You don't have to have a course, right? Um, you can live your life as an example, like being your true self in everything you do is mentoring on a daily basis because your calmness, your gentleness in a situation, even just talking to, um, you know, the grocery store clerk um, is going to make a difference. Somebody gets frustrated because something didn't scan right or whatever, and you stay calm, you are mentoring, you're living by example, you're modeling calm grounded behavior I that's like that. a mentor yeah nice yeah that's anyways great. modeling it yeah nice yeah that was good you can run on man. you can <laughs> run on um i want to ask you what has been your greatest spiritual awakening and if it's something that you can tell us about and what happened um you know i i this question is such an interesting one. I'm not sure that there was there was a moment that I awakened. I think that that it came about slowly from the time I was a child. I'm a I'm a shamanic practitioner. That's and I and I practice Kundalini. These what is are my what is the first what was the first practice? I'm a shamanic practitioner. So shamanism. Okay. Is uh, not a religion. It's a it's a practice of working with. Uh, spirit energy all that's all around us it's a mm. uh, it's the original uh spiritual practice been around for over forty thousand years and many uh religions today actually come from uh shamanic practices mm. but the idea of working with uh spirit energy of all because we're all vibrating energy right so yes. when i Spirit, I'm talking about because I'm I'm equal left right brain, so I like science and spirit to be balanced. Hmm. So when I talk about spirit energy, I'm talking about energy um, in a in a scientific sense as well. Um, we're working with the energy of all around us for the benefit of self, humanity, the planet, cosmos, um, the plants, rocks, animals, that kind of thing. So. Mm -hmm. um, so I practice shamanism and kundalini yoga. So ever since I was a child, I've 
felt deeply connected to all around me. When I when we talk about spiritual awakening, I think that it un- unfolded very slowly for me uh, because I feel that I was sort of born awakened and then the door shut when I had to deal with society. Um, mm-hmm. And then I slowly had to pry that door back open. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've had... Um, I've had spiritual uh, moments, moments where I felt deeply connected uh, to something other mm-hmm. sporadically throughout my life. And I can share one with you, which was um, giving birth to my son. Um, I had a home birth. And, oh, wow. And, yeah, um, gave birth to him on my bedroom floor. What? And, was this on purpose or by accident? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, it was very, very planned. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So I was like, no bathtub, life. there's no pool. Like, okay. No, oh, oh, we had the pool. I just didn't want to get in it. I was like, I'm not leaving my bed. You know? Wow. <laughs> we had a pool. We had a whole pool and and uh, I just didn't want to get in it. So, you know, you just listen to your body in that moment. Mm. But what was interesting was... Um, I was 40 years old when I had him and um, I was doing sort of, uh, there's a thing called hypnobirthing where you can help. uh, So you don't need to take medication for the pain that you would use hypnosis to help you. Yeah. Well, did it work? I still had a lot. I had a lot of pain, but what the hypnosis did was it allowed my body to relax and it made the, um, the birthing process so much faster. So for a first time, uh, first time mom at 40, my entire labor was only 17 and a half hours, which really isn't that long. So uh, but w- the the spiritual moment that happened was um, around two in the morning, I was in active labor. Um, and for some reason, Whenever I closed my eyes, I saw the numbers five, three, and seven um, repeating over and over again, five, three, seven, five, three, seven. And I was like, okay, that's weird. Um, But I'm busy. I have to give birth to this child. And so I was on a birthing stool at one point, which is one of the finest inventions ever, uh, which is basically like a regular stool, but it has the bottom cut out of it. So your legs are propped up, but it has room for the baby to drop. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. It's been around for centuries. Brilliant, brilliant. Look, idea. I learned something else new. I never heard of that. Yeah, I know, right? I didn't, and, and, <laughs> I'm sure uh, most men haven't. <laughs> yeah, so great. Happy to educate. Um, but yeah, the birthing stool was brilliant. But when I actually gave birth to my son, I, we got rid of that. I was lying on the floor on my side. When my son was born, came out of my body, I rolled my head uh over to look at the clock and it was 5 37 in the morning oh wow and so i knew <laughs> something had happened during this you know non-ordinary reality consciousness that i had been in mm. um during childbirth and that that some communication had crossed for me that was a moment of understanding that there is much more going on than we can just see and, yes. and feel in, in this dimension. Mm. Yeah. Yes. I love that. That's good. That's a good one. Yeah, that was, it was a good one. <laughs> and the baby is here, right? So all of yeah, it. Yeah, he's here. He's awesome. Yeah. Now, do you recommend <laughs> to give the home birth after you've done this? Would you recommend people to do it or would or go to the hospital? <laughs> Um, it depends on the person. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that people need to do what they are called to do. There is no right and there is no wrong. Um, what I say that you should do all your research and listen to your deepest soul. Um, for me, going to a hospital felt all kinds of wrong. Mm. Um, and I, I do not regret it in the least. I never had a moment during that time that I felt like I made the wrong choice. Um, and, and I had minor complications during the, during the birth, but very minor. And even still, I was like, we will get through this. So you have to do what's right for you, yes. you know, because we can't be judging people based on their choices like that. I know that's right. 
<laughs> I'm like, whatever you prefer is fine for me. Like, I'm not involved for sure. Yeah. What matters is what matters is that you and your child are healthy and happy. Yes, know? exactly. That is the main kit and caboodle. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. I wanted to ask you, um, can you share with us about um, how can we understand more about the power we have within us? Yeah. Do you have any tips or any practice ideas, something that you can leave us with to, for the listeners to understand that a little more? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so this kind of harks back to what we were talking about in terms of solitude. Um, the power we have within us can only be accessed by us, which means you need to spend some time in solitude and not be afraid of being alone with your thoughts and being alone with your feelings. Remember, they are all part of you. You own them. They're yours. And so part of our power is understanding that we do have dark and light within us, but it's not there to kill us. It's there to make us stronger. So once we understand, and, and that's part of our power is, is even just recognizing that. Yeah. Mm. But in terms of tips and practices, um, I always recommend a couple of things to develop a solitude practice. And that can be five minutes or five hours, if you have it, where you spend time alone with yourself doing something that gives you joy. Mm. It could be anything, but it can't involve other people. So that doesn't mean faffing around on Facebook. That means um, whether it's knitting or reading or journaling or meditating or taking a hot bath or a walk in the park or whatever, where you are alone with your being and befriending it. Mm. Um, but, but that you make a commitment to do this, like I said, either five minutes or a couple hours or whatever, a day, every single day. Um, and people say, I don't have time to do that. Well, you use the bathroom alone, don't you? (laughs) Okay. Okay. You know, so mm-hmm. if it's if it's a if it's a hundred twenty second meditation, you know, then you can do that when you close the bathroom door. True, right? So everybody has time to do this. Mm-hmm. So, um, okay, so that's one, and and another tip is um, what I call the self alignment meditation. Now, I'm not going to walk you through it. Because on on my podcast, which is Self Talk with Rachel Astarte, it's episode 23. We'll walk you through the entire self-alignment meditation. But what this does is whenever we're feeling out of sorts or we're having an emotion that makes us feel off center, this meditation helps us to realign ourselves with that emotion. So we go deep into the emotion. If it's fear, jealousy, anger, uh, anxiety, depression, rage, what you know, whatever it is, or or we're madly in love and we can't concentrate on our work. That counts <laughs> too. It's gotten us out of alignment. So that meditation really helps uh, for us to uh, harness our power, right, and ground us in in that foundation of self. Yeah. Wow! Awesome! Awesome! Yes, on your self talk podcast. Yes, mm-hmm. it's awesome. There's a lot of great and goodies on there and a lot of great guests as well, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd like to close with this final question. Is your glass sure. half empty or half full? <laughs> I think you know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, just you it, can just give it to it us does. anyway. It is half full, absolutely half full. And, and in fact, sometimes I think, it's half full because the other glass is already filled to overflowing. And this, is the <laughs> <laughs> this is the extra one that's been slid up this underneath. Is an extra it, right? glass. Yes. I love that. <laughs> that's great. That's so good, Rachel. That's so good. Oh, <laughs> yes. Do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? Um, I think. I mean, you gave us a lot of goodies, all... but. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, as a final thought. Um, don't be afraid of yourself. Don't be afraid of yourself. Don't do, because that's what trips us all up. And remember, this is this is probably even more important. Understand the importance of your individual life and how it contributes to collective consciousness. Right. So so 
when we live our best life, and I don't mean that you're making money and you're you're doing all the good things. I mean, when you are comfortable in who you are, that energy radiates out and that's what contributes to collective consciousness. It makes a difference. It ripples. So just be gentle with yourself and don't be afraid of who you are. And, um, and I'm vibrating with you as a sibling. So. Oh, I love that. That's cute. That is super cute. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Oh, and can you tell everyone how they can reach you if they're interested to find out more about you? Sure. Um, the best place is to go to rachelastartetherapy.com or you can just go to midlifementorship.com. It goes to the same place. Sometimes sometimes it's easier to remember midlifementorship.com. <laughs> uh, True. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook. Both of them are Rachel Astarte Therapy. Um, I'm on TikTok at the same handle. Um, but yeah, that's those are the best places to find me. And and please do if if you're a woman in midlife listening to this, we need you. Please at least uh, join the mailing list and and stay in touch because we need your voice. Yeah, and and even if you're not, get in touch with me and and um, I'm here for you know in service of everyone. So that's how people can get to me. And and of course the the podcast. You can get it wherever you get podcasts. It's self-talk with Rachel Astarte. Excellent. And all of this information will be listed in the episode, so they'll be able to easily find it there, um, just in case people weren't able to write down real fast. So you could rewind it, slide it back and rewind. <laughs> but um, we thank you so much. It was so great. You gave us a lot of a lot of great information um, touching upon the undeveloped ego and the developed ego, something that I didn't know that there was a split of two. So that was awesome. Mm. Talking about boundaries or not walls and the differences about them. Um, I love that we were able to get into the breakdown about the radical honesty and self-alignment mm. and feeling that we need to get ourselves back together. Sometimes we are out of alignment. And with that, things you know, things can happen when we're out of alignment spiritually, physically, you know, so that's awesome as well. Um, and taking some time for solitude for us to be alone, to be able to really recharge and reach our highest self. Um, mm -hmm. Building on a strong foundation was really um, a strong foundation of self was really awesome. And really having that and from there, we can really grow and build. So, yes, awesome, awesome. Such great information. Thank you so much for being a guest here on Glass Half Full. We are so happy that we've had you today. I'm so happy to have been here. Thank you so much, Chris. You are very welcome. We'll be in touch real soon. You have a great day. You too. Thank you. And thank you to all our listeners listening in to another episode of Glass Half Full, a podcast and a safe platform for everyone to share their life experiences. Once again, I'm your host, Chris Levins. Please subscribe, follow, and rate this podcast on Apple Music and Spotify for more learning experiences. Until next time, know you are blessed. See ya!